photography is ultimately a creative medium. Yes, there is a lot to know technically, and this course has focused on mainly those elements up until now, but I would argue that the creative lessons that you are about to learn are the most important to stepping up the photos that you take with your iPhone. Photography can mainly be broken down into light, composition, and subject. The most effective images make use of each of these elements and intrigue the eye on each of these different levels. All of the lessons in this section can be funneled into one of these three categories. You'll leave this section with an understanding of the creative process of photography and how to see like a photographer. The first lesson that you must know is the importance of observing your surroundings. This is different than looking at something. Really put in an effort to be present in a given moment and notice more intensely. I'll often see students when they're first learning photography looking at the world through their camera lens or on their camera screen. This might be good for understanding what view a focal length can give you. Otherwise, I find it much more useful to connect with my environment just with my own eyes. I'm able to look around with more ease and when something piques my interest, it's as simple as raising my camera to start the process of composing. When it comes to composing our images, there are many guides that we can use to make our images more interesting or pleasing to look at. It's important to know that these are not compositional rules. Rather, they're principles that can serve as tools that can help you problem solve when you're taking photos and help fix a stale image. The first and perhaps the most popular compositional guide is the rule of thirds. The rule of thirds offers a way to compose our subjects based on a three by three grid. This is the same grid that we enabled on our iPhone camera many steps ago. This principle suggests that by placing subjects on these third lines or even better at one of the four intersecting points, we'll be able to produce a better composition. By doing so, we are ultimately creating more dynamism and still maintaining balance in our image. When we place images dead center in our frame, that doesn't leave our eye to wander much in the frame. But when we compose using the rule of thirds, we leave space to wander and come back to our subject in that familiar third. To show this principle in action, here we have a subject placed dead center in the frame. We're going to use the rule of thirds to make this a little more interesting and dynamic. First, let's deal with our horizon line. We can experiment tilting our camera down and up and see which third we prefer the horizon line to be on. In this case, I think it looks better on the bottom third. Then we can move our camera left or right to position our subject on one of the vertical thirds. I think I prefer the left third in this case so that we can see the shadow on the ground. And there we have it. Now our subject is placed right on those intersecting points and it's time to take our photo. With inanimate objects like this one or any subject that you have the ability to move, you can always find the frame you like for your background and then move your subject accordingly. This example is great for seeing the principle in a simplified manner, but the rule of thirds can become a little trickier when you have a busier frame. Keep in mind that not all elements in your frame need to line up with one of these thirds. Instead, Try to place the focal point of your image, your horizon, or a dominating element in your frame on one of these thirds. When deciding which third to place an element on, consider the movement that it might be making or if it's facing in a certain way. You'll generally want to give them space in the direction that they're moving or the side that they're facing. The compositional technique of layering breaks an image down into three separate layers known as foreground, middle ground, and background. The foreground elements are closest to the camera, background is the furthest, and middle ground are the elements in between the two. By placing elements in more than one layer, you can add depth and dimension to your images. One of my favorite ways to use this technique is to find compositions that create distinctly separate layers. 
doing so has a way of emphasizing shape and form. Another way is to use elements that cross through the layers to draw the viewer's eye through the image. This closely relates to our next guide, which is leading lines. This technique refers to lines in an image that cross through the frame to direct the viewer's eye to a certain point in an image. When using leading lines, experiment with your vertical and horizontal axis in relation to that line and see how it can affect the way that the element crosses through your frame and how it leads your eye to certain points in your image. Framing refers to composing elements to create a subframe in your image. This should ideally lead to your subject. This technique can be used to focus the attention of your viewer. Filling the frame encourages you to get close to your subject and make your subject take up the entire or most of your image. This technique can be used sparingly to remind you to crop unimportant elements out of your frame and only include the most important ones. It can also be used to go extremely close to a subject and fill the entire frame. This is going to start to emphasize detail, pattern, shape and form, or the texture of your subject. Opposite to filling the frame, this technique puts more emphasis on the negative element of your image or the empty space surrounding positive elements. Negative space can be used to isolate a subject and focus the viewer's attention. This is commonly used in portrait photography. Lastly, balance is the compositional guideline that seeks to place elements so that they have equal visual weight. A balanced image is one where all of the areas of importance or our subjects command the viewer's attention equally. One doesn't outweigh the other. The viewer finds themselves looking at these elements equally. This can be achieved symmetrically where an object is mirrored from its center point. This usually relies on a subject that is symmetrical to begin with. Balance can also be achieved asymmetrically by placing subjects off center in a balanced manner relationally. This takes more practice to get right, but will start to come more naturally the more that you use techniques like the rule of thirds. Moving on from the compositional guidelines, we're going to discuss some other ways to think about your composition. If I had to choose one compositional technique to teach someone, it would be viewpoint, which stresses the importance of where you stand when you take a photo. This principle is all about moving your feet and considering your position in relation to the elements in your photo. When taking a photo, you can change your elevation, your angle, left-right position, and your distance from the subject. Each of these choices is going to have a significant impact on your image in terms of how your subject is portrayed, what elements make it into your image or are cut out from your image, and it can even infuse a narrative into your image. The photographer's viewpoints are commonly classified as eye level, high angle, low angle, bird's eye view, and worm's eye view. Eye level photos are taken from the same height as the subject or the photographer's eye. This is easily the most explored view since it's the most natural. You see something that you want to take a picture of, so you raise your camera up to your eye and you click shutter. I'm going to challenge you to start incorporating some of these other viewpoints into your images. The next one that we can look at is high angle. These images are taken from an elevated perspective. In order to achieve these photos, we need to get higher than our subject. Sometimes that comes easily if you're taking a photo of a plate of food, for instance, but sometimes this means hiking to a higher vantage point. Narratively speaking, High angles can give the viewer the sense that they are looking down on a subject. So when shooting people, this angle can make them appear weak or submissive. You can also use a slightly higher than eye level view when taking portraits of people. And this is generally going to thin out their face and make for a more pleasing portrait. Next, we have low angle view. These are images that are taken from a lower perspective. Crouching down is usually the easiest way to go about getting a low angle photo. Sometimes it takes laying down. Don't be afraid to get dirty. If you're working with larger subjects like a mountain or a building, then 
getting a low angle is probably going to come much easier. In this case, you can make the angle feel lower by getting closer to the subject or feel more eye level by moving further away from the subject. The next viewpoints are at the extreme ends of high angle and low angle. The first one is bird's eye view. Any image taken from a high perspective looking directly down or almost directly down is generally considered to be a bird's eye view. Drone photography is perhaps the most popular way to achieve this, but you don't need a drone to get this view. You can again hike to a higher vantage point or you can shoot smaller subjects and achieve what is commonly referred to as a lay flat image where you organize elements on a flat ground to create a pleasing arrangement. This can also be done well with food photography, product photography, or still life. Lastly, we can take our photos from a worm's eye view, which is the extreme end of our low angle view. These images are taken from a low perspective looking directly up or almost directly up. This view is probably the least popular of the bunch, but it's a great view to use for architecture photography, nature photography, or abstract images. Before we wrap this section up on viewpoint, I want to leave you with a thought that usually guides me when I'm taking photos. I try to remind myself often that the position I find myself when I notice an interesting subject is very rarely the best one to be in. This thought, whether it's true or not for that particular scene, forces me to quickly consider all of the other possible positions that I could be in to take an image of that subject. This might reinforce that I am in the right position or that I might need to move a few feet over to the left and shoot at a lower angle. The more you take photos and experiment with these different views, the more capable you're going to be at visualizing these different viewpoints. In order to get started, you can do this simple exercise that will get you to explore every viewpoint. When you come across a subject that you want to take a picture of, force yourself to do a 360 degree walk around of that subject. Do this from far away and from up close. Explore viewing that subject from a low angle and a high angle. When you find a good position, take a photo and continue exploring. Later on, you can review your photos and take note of which ones worked and consider why they worked so well. This is an exercise that I still use to this day when I'm trying to find a new composition for a certain subject and can really open you up to all of the possible viewpoints that you can use when taking pictures of subjects. The next creative tip is to use your camera size to your advantage. Luckily with the iPhone, we have a leg up in terms of most other cameras when it comes to its small form factor. This means that we can easily fit our iPhone in hard to reach places and experiment with perspectives that generally aren't possible with larger cameras. The concept of simplification suggests that you should only include what's necessary in your images. What you exclude from your image is just as important as what you include. Removing any distracting elements from your images is always a good practice. This can often result in minimalist photography if you boil the elements down to one or two elements, but this concept is useful for all types of photography because the essence of it is really to compose your image to include only the elements that matter. If you're capturing a demonstration or an event, that could mean many elements in your photo. So it's not a matter of reducing elements just for the sake of it, but removing those elements that don't belong. The last compositional technique that I'm going to share with you is to Think abstractly. Often we find ourselves trying to capture the likeness of our subjects, but there is a whole other way to capture subjects that is more focused on shape and form. This means that you're composing images that perhaps focus on a certain detail of a subject, the texture of that object, the way that light contours its edges, or the way that colors and shapes are interacting. At this point in the course, you should have a good understanding of the many different ways that we can use composition to take better photos. There are many different tools that we can employ in our images, such as the rule of thirds, leading lines, or layering. 
it can be a little overwhelming to try to absorb all of this information at once. If you only take one thing away from these ideas, it should be that the arrangement of the elements in your photo and your position to these elements matter a great deal to taking better images. Experiment with different angles, move your feet, and only show what's important in your images.